Sing it together. His name.
great. Good morning. Good morning. Are you alive? Good Are you alive. awake? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We just want to welcome you to Celebration Church Johannesburg this morning. Are you excited? Yay. Hallelujah. And if you're joining us online, we are so happy to be with you this morning. And um, I just want to acknowledge our very special group of people. If you're here for the very first time and you're joining Celebration Church Johannesburg on site and also online, can you please just raise up your hand, um, push your notification button so that we can know that you're joining us for the first time. If you're here on site, please just raise up your hand so that we can celebrate you and love on you. Hallelujah. Amen. I see one person there. Do we have any other people? Oh, yes. We have three more people are there. Hallelujah. Amen. And if you're joining us online, please let us know so that we can love on you as well. Hallelujah. So our ushers are going to move around and give you a VIP sticker. And VIP means a very important person. Soon after the service, we will meet with you, love on you, tell you all about Celebration Church Johannesburg and all our FOCs and all that we are all about. Amen. So now we've got a very special treat for you. And we're going to celebrate and enjoy, enjoy you this morning. Amen. Every knee shall bow. 
are holy, Lord. You are high and lifted up. You are high and lifted up. The King of Glory. Hallelujah. King of glory. Glory, glory, glory to you, Lord of Lords. Glory, glory, glory to you, Jesus. Will you lead me? I will follow. When you call me, I will answer. Oh, my Lord, please teach me how to know your way. When
my soul says yes. My soul says yes. Says yes. Says yes. My soul says yes. Says yes to you. My soul. Father, as we stand in your presence, we say yes, Lord. Yes to your agenda. Yes to your plan. We say, Lord, have your way in us. Have a way in our lives. Even as we surrender and yield ourselves to you, we say yes, Lord. Whatever you will, maybe, wherever you may lead, whichever you will, where you may choose, we say yes, Lord. Lord, as a church, we say yes. Yes to your will, yes to your plan. Yes to your purpose. Father, as we lift our hands to you, up our faces to you, Lord. We say you are Lord. We say yes to your Lordship. We say yes to your command. Yes to your instruction. Whichever way, Lord, you may lead, we say yes to you. Help us, Lord, and strengthen us for the journey. Lord, we are committed to follow whichever way you may lead. Father, I pray for every child of God in this moment, under the sound of my voice, as we yield ourselves, may we hear your voice. You are the one who said, when you come to the crossroads, you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk you in it. Father, you promised that you'd guide us with your eye. You'll lead us by your spirit. Father, I pray for every child of God who may be at a crossroads, who may, be at a, who may have a dilemma, may they be led of you, may they be able to say yes when they hear your voice. So we yield ourselves to your plan, to your purpose. Even as this morning, Lord, we say, you have your way in us. You have your way through us, in our families, in our lives, in our finances. We say yes to your will. Father, we know it is your will that we may lack nothing. And we say yes to that will. We know it is your will that we may walk in divine health. For by his stripes we are healed. And our souls say yes. Yes to your word. Father, we know it is your will that none should perish. And our souls say yes. Yes to your will. This Father, you said, my sheep hear my voice. Another they will not follow. We say yes. Yes to your will. And yes to your way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Praise God.
Go ahead and take your seats if you will. Thank you, worship team. Thank you for leading us so well. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. See at your neighbor, neighbor. Even though it is cold, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. We serve a good God. You know, it was Ora Roberts who used to say, the devil is a bad devil and God is a good God. It was true then, it's still true today. God is a good God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. So we, we continue on the on our journey that we started four weeks ago, the passion for the harvest. And today I want to, last week we did talk about an adjustment of our, of our hearts, an adjustment of our mindsets. So today I want to kick off from there and say, you know, it's great to have a passion for the harvest, but we need to understand what motivates us. What is the motivation for the harvest? So I want to talk to you today about motivation for the harvest. Hallelujah. So in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38, the Bible says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So clearly he's saying that the, the challenge is not the harvest. The challenge is not that it's, the, it's not time for harvest yet. He says the harvest is ripe. The fields are white unto harvest. But he says the challenge is that there are fewer workers. So pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. In other words, the workers may be there, but they are not motivated. They are not inspired. They are not, they are not driven. They don't feel that passion. They, they, they don't understand it. So he says, pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. And in John 4, 34 to 35, Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. I am motivated to do the will of him who sent me. And not only am I motivated to do the will of him who sent me, but I am motivated to finish his work. And he says, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe unto harvest. He's saying, you guys, you say there's still four months, there's still time. Oh, you know what? They, it's not yet time to win souls. It's not yet time. There's still time. So we are buying time because we are not motivated. We, are, we, are, we don't have the, the edge. We don't have something that's pushing us. But he says, no, 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 no. He says, don't procrastinate. The time is now. He says, open your eyes for the fields are white to harvest. So I, I know we have been talking about the harvest and, and many people say, yeah, we are talking about this passion of the harvest. What exactly is it? When we talk about the passion for the harvest, we are talking about the harvest of souls. In other words, we are talking about evangelism. So let me make sure that we are on the same page right from the beginning. So when we talk about evangelism, I want the way I am defining it is that evangelism is the proclamation of the good news, of the redemptive act of God in Christ Jesus to a world that is alienated from God. To a world that is bound in sin, that is under the sentence of condemnation, with the intention that people will come to put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation and to serve him in the fellowship of the church. Let, let's break it down a little bit. So we're saying evangelism is the proclamation of the good news. It's a proclamation. It means somebody must announce the news. Somebody must tell the story. Somebody must, must declare that there is good news. Somebody must say there is a redemption that God has planned. Because we are proclaiming not ourselves. We are proclaiming not the church. But we are proclaiming the redemptive act of God in Christ. God has already done what was needed to save people. God has already done what was 
was needed to bring people to salvation. Our redemption is possible because God has done it. That's what we preach. We preach that which God has done on the cross of Calvary. We preach that which Jesus did for the salvation of people. So we are proclaiming to a world that is estranged from God, a world that has no relationship with God, that is moving away from God, the world which is bound in sin. You know, when you look at people today, they look happy, they look like everything is okay, but appearances are deceiving. People are struggling under the bondage of sin. People are struggling with the, being tormented by the devil. And the good news is to say they can walk in freedom. That's why the Bible says that God has anointed me that I may proclaim freedom and liberty to those who are bound. The world in which we live, the people who are around us who do not know Jesus Christ, they are bound in sin. They are strangers from God. They are under the sentence of condemnation, bound to go to hell. So the good news is you don't have to die in sin. You don't have to remain in condemnation. You don't have to remain under the sentence of death because Jesus has paid the price. So that's what, we are, that's what we are proclaiming. That is what brings in the harvest. And the intention of that proclamation is so that when they hear the good news, when they know that Jesus has paid the price, they, they will be able to put their trust in him. They will come to, to the feet of Christ for salvation. And they will serve him within the context of the fellowship of the church. And that is evangelism. So let me say it again. Evangelism is the proclamation of the good news of the redemptive act of God in Christ Jesus to a world that is alienated from God, that is bound in sin and under the sentence of condemnation with the intention that those people will come to put their trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation and serve him within the fellowship of his church. And that's what brings in the harvest. And when we talk about the, 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 the evangelism, I, I like something that was, that was said by George Peters. This is what he says. He says, evangelism does not take place until the good news has been orally, intelligently, and clearly communicated. You know, there are some people who say, oh, you know what, I, I, I preach with the way I live. I mean, I don't have to say anything. I just live good. No, 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 no. That's just an appetizer. The gospel has not been preached until it has been verbalized, until it has been spoken orally. We have to go and tell. We have to communicate with words. We have to communicate intelligently in a language, in a way, in a simplicity that people can understand. And it has to be communicated clearly. When that has happened, then we say, the evangelism has taken place. And that's what will bring to the harvest. So I want to give you eight motivations, eight reasons, or eight things that can motivate us to, to for the harvest. So motivation number one is that as God's ambassadors, our highest responsibility and our greatest privilege is to share the good news. You see, God has, has made us ambassadors and he has given us a responsibility and a privilege. Many people see it as just as the preaching, the proclamation of the gospel. We see it as just an obligation, but no, it's a privilege. God has privileged us to share the good news. Can you imagine, I mean, the, the responsibility of being made an ambassador and go and tell the people good news. Go and pro proclaim something good that is about to come. That is our responsibility. God has called us and given us a responsibility that we may he may make his appeal through us to the world so we have a responsibility second corinthians 5 18 to 20 says this it says all this is from god who has reconciled us to himself through christ jesus and given us a ministry of reconciliation that god was reconciled the world to himself in christ jesus not counting men's sins against them and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation we are therefore god's christ's ambassadors as though god were making his appeal through us we implore you in christ's behalf be reconciled to god so this is a, an incredible responsibility that God has made us send us out to represent him into the world, to represent him to a dying world and show them that there is hope. You know, people are living with hopelessness. The level of people who are attempting suicide because of the condemnation of the world, because of the sense of hopelessness. And we have the privilege, we have the honor to go and tell them you don't have to kill yourself. You don't have to give up your life. You don't have to live in a hopelessness. The Bible says we were without hope 
hope without God, without Christ, being strangers to the covenants of promise. But you can say to somebody, you can belong. The world may look like it's rejecting you. Nobody accepts you. But I want you to know that God loves you. You are accepted in the beloved. As we share though, that good news, it's an incredible responsibility. It's an incredible privilege to see somebody who was on their way to hell with their lives being completely transformed and having hope again. And that's the responsibility we have. So we are motivated by the responsibility and by the privilege that we have been given to go share the gospel. Hallelujah. You see, as an ambassador, I know that I represent my kingdom. And I, I, I know there's, there's a privilege that I have. But it's not just a privilege. There's also a responsibility. So when we talk about evangelism, it's because we have been, we have been sent, we have been delegated to represent the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And that's an awesome responsibility. And that should, 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 should challenge us to say, I have a work to do. I have a responsibility that I have been assigned to. Because God is appealing to the world to say, be reconciled to God. That is our, we have been given a whole ministry Ministry, a minister of reconciliation so that those who have been alienated from God, those who have no relationship with God may be reconciled with him. They may come to a place of peace. People where we have even walked away from God, even those who have backslidden, because we, are, we have a minister of reconciliation, we are bringing them back to a relationship with God. Hallelujah. And that's motivation number one. Motivation number two for the harvest. <coughs> Excuse me is that if God's love is fresh in us, it compels us to tell the dying world of that redeeming love. You see, if, if I'm gripped by the love of God, if I know the love of God, if I know what God did for me, and I, I am aware, I am alive to the fact that God loved me. He, when I was unworthy, when I was undeserving, he loved me. While I was yet a sinner, he reached out to me and he redeemed me. I don't forget where I came from. I don't forget who I was without a hope, without a direction in my life. I may have looked like I was a righteous sinner, but I was hopeless in my, in my thinking that I'm okay. But God's love Love came upon me. It dawned on me. And as I sense that love, as I live in that freshness, out of gratitude and excitement of that love, then it compels me to reach out to others and tell them about that love. So it's very possible that when our love is, is what's called, when our love is beginning to wane, then we don't have that compulsion. We don't feel the compulsion. If you ever notice somebody who is in love, they want to tell everybody. I mean, they always pull up their phone. Hey, did you see? This is my, my beloved. This is, and they're showing because that, that love is fresh in them. Is it possible the reason we are not about evangelism is because something has happened to our love? Is it possible it's an indicator of our relationship with Jesus? But if that love is fresh, if we remember where we were, if we remember what he did for us, that compels us to share the redeeming, the redeeming love of Christ with the dying world. Romans 5, 5 says this, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God was poured upon our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So that when the love of God is poured in my heart, that love overwhelms, that love is overflowing, that love abounds. And I feel like telling somebody, I want to share the love. I think we were singing a song, I can't hold it any longer. I've got to tell somebody. I can't keep it to myself. That, that is what we're talking about. When there's a freshness of the love of God, when I'm aware, when I'm alive, when I'm conscious to how much God loved me, how much God loves the world, I will share the story. So that's our motivation. You see, 1 John 4, verses 9 to 10 says this, In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation, to be the forgiveness, to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. When I'm aware of this love, that Jesus died on the cross, he who was without sin became sin for my sake. He 
we had never sinned. We, had, we, we, we were tempted in all things and yet without sin. But on the cross, he took my place. When I think about that, it tells, it makes me so fall in love with him that I want to tell others about Jesus. So when we talk about the harvest of souls, I am motivated by the realization that Jesus, the love of my life, became the atoning sacrifice. He laid down his life for a dying world. And he gave me a responsibility to go tell that world that you don't have to die in sin. You don't have to die sick. You don't have to die poor. You don't have, because there is good news. There is somebody who became your substitute. There is somebody who died on the cross in your place. So God sent his only begotten son into the world that through him we might live. You see, people are living in death, dead in their sins, but you are saying you can live again. Hallelujah. You see, once we understand this love, it should motivate us. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says this. It says, for the love of Christ compels us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So the love of God compels me when I know that Jesus died for me, when I know that he took my place, he was my substitute. When I understand that, when I'm compelled by that, that tells me that I no longer live for myself. I no longer live for my pleasure, but I live for him who died. And what does it mean to live for him who died? It means I live for his purpose. I live for that which he values. And he's one of the highest things he values is the salvation of souls. So I begin to live for him. I spend my life. I spend my energies. I spend my prayers. I spend my focus in bringing in that harvest. So that's what motivates me. When the love of God is fresh in my heart. When I realize the price he paid. That love compels me to tell a dying world that there is hope. You know, there are so many people who are, I mean, we, 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 we see and we admire people. There are people who are self-medicating in drugs, in alcohol, in prostitution, in, in lascivious, they're doing all kinds of things, but it is really trying to run away from themselves. And you look at them and say, ah, no, these guys, they are having fun. No, they're not having fun. What you see is people trying to run from themselves. They can't stay sober because they, they I mean, the pain inside them is so incredible. So they have to, they have to take the narcotics of drugs of, of, of alcohol or some of sexual promiscuity so that they forget the emptiness inside but that's where the good news comes to say you don't have to self medicate Jesus died on the cross that you may walk in freedom the other time I had a call from, 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 from somebody who, who, who connected to us through some, uh, uh, some digital evangelism. And, and he was saying, you know, I, 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 am, I'm, I attempted to, to kill myself. I said, why did you attempt to kill yourself? He says, ah, you know, I, I, I was sent to you because I attempted to kill myself because I had been rejected by a girlfriend. So we start talking about, about this and, and it looks at like that girlfriend who rejected he had been cheating anyway so many times. And he says, I try to tell you, no, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But this girlfriend, who in my view is not even worth it anyway because she is living a life of cheating on you. But, but he wants to kill himself. And, says the, and she's going around to, to, to the school. We went to school together and all the schoolmates around us, they, 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 she, she's telling them about me because I, I, I mean, I cannot take it anymore. And I said, you don't have to do that. I mean, you, you're thinking about, this is somebody who's not born again. They, they don't even know Christ. They, 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 they just saw this clip to say, why are you angry? And in response to that, he reached out to us and said, I need help. That's what's happening. People are being tormented by the world. And we have the privilege of remembering the love of God who, who died, who sent his son to die for us. 
Listen, many believers, we, we struggle with sharing gospel because we think, oh, we are intruding. But you know, these people are gasping. They, they are hungry. They are thirsty. They are dying. If only we tell them there is a hope. When we reach out to them, they say, thank you for talking to me. I remember this guy when, when I was speaking to him on the phone. I never met him. I think he, they, they, there's a place called Sosha, Sosha Ngue, is it? Yeah, so he was calling from there. So we are talking, and, and he says, you know, you know what he says to me? He says, you are the only person who has ever listened to my story. And, and I followed up on him a number of times, and he says, you know, I, I, I really appreciate, I mean, I, and so he, he forgot about the, the committing suicide, and he was saying, I'm so happy, I, I really appreciate, you are the only person who has followed up on me. You know, there are people who are longing just to be heard. And yet we are afraid to talk to them. Don't you think it's a lie of the devil that he, he, there are people who are, who are struggling here. They, they, they need to hear the story. But then he, to us, he says, you are going to embarrass yourself. You can't talk. So we, we never get to meet. So we are the solution. But we don't meet people who are desperate for a solution because the devil is lying to us. But when the love of God is fresh in your heart, you say, I don't care. I mean, you, you know, I've, 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 I mean, I've seen people who love some people. You look at this person. You know, there are people who are very interesting. You know, there's no, nobody who is ugly, right? I was told by my mother. People just have interesting faces. So you see somebody say, they're showing you this face. They say, you know, isn't, isn't he beautiful? If it's handsome. And you're saying, that's a very interesting face. <laughs> but but you see, that's why they say love is blind. <laughs> you see? So, so you, you see, they, they, they are so enamored by love and they want to tell everybody. But what happened to us? How about to, to the love of God? I mean, why can't you feel, you know, can't you see? People say, ah, this guy who is on the cross, how can you love somebody who is so, so mad and he's on the cross? Says, Don't you understand? This is the love of my life. That's the story we must tell. Hallelujah. When the love of God is fresh in our hearts, we will tell the world. Motivation number three. You see, we take the Great Commission as Christ's command seriously, as his last charge and mandate to us. You see, when, when, you, when, you see when, when we hear about the Great Commission, when we hear about the commandment to go and tell the story, sometimes we, we take it lightly because we don't understand that it is a command. It's an instruction. It's a mandate that he gave. He says, go and tell them. Go make disciples. This is a command. This is an instruction. And when we understand that it's a command, we are going to take it seriously. I mean, most of us, if, you, if, if, a, if, if a loved one or if somebody, you know, they say something to you, particularly on their deathbed, the last thing they say, you'll never forget it. You'll even go and document it. And you make sure that you, you keep that word. And this is what Jesus did. The last thing he gave was a command. He says, go and tell them. So we are motivated by the obedience to Christ. Because we know not only is it because it's his last word, but it's a command. You see, it's, it's, there's, there's, there's something that we don't understand as believers. You see, in one way we say he is Lord. We say Jesus is the Lord of my life, but we disobey his commandments. How does it work? You see, when he is Lord, he is worth to be obeyed. So his command is an instruction to me. And I obey him. So when we understand that obeying the great commission, the great command to go and tell the world, is a matter of discipleship. I cannot genuinely follow him and say I'm obedient to him when I am not telling people about Jesus. Hallelujah. So it's a command. It's about discipleship. The same way that we, we know that a Christian discipline is praying, is reading the word. God says, when you do my commands, I love you and will come and live among you. And one of those commands says, go and tell them. So I take the, the, the preaching of the gospel, I take the great commission seriously because it is Christ's command. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, this is after the resurrection. 
All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you until the end of the age. So he gives a command. He gives an instruction. He says, lo, I am with you until the end of the age. He says, I am here. I am going to, I, I want to go, but I want you to go. I am with you. You will never go alone. I will walk with you. He says, I will be with you. And that's why in, in Mark, he says that, and they went preaching the gospel, and the Lord was working with them, confirming the word with the signs following. So he says, go and tell them. That's the commandment that he, he told us. We see it again in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 18. And Jesus said to them, go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And if these signs will follow those who believe in my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So he says, I want you to go to a dying world, and cast the demons, set people free. There are people who are demonized, people who are possessed by demons. There are people who can't sleep at night. There are people who are harassed in their sleep. And the good news is that when I go preach the gospel, I am going to pray for those people who will set those people free. I mean, with their people in slavery to the devil who are waiting for freedom and we have the key, we have the authority to go and set them free. And yet, we are doing nothing about it. So we need to take the message of Christ seriously. And that's our motivation I will obey him. I will tell people about Jesus. Hallelujah. So you see, when he talks about the, this great commission, he, he says, particularly Matthew 28, he says, go and make disciples of nations. He says, baptizing them to, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Whenever somebody was baptized, it was like an induction into discipleship. And he says, teach them to obey everything that I have told you. So in other words, the, it's not just going a hit and run and you say, oh, Jesus loves you, then you run away. No, he says, you, you bring them to Christ. You disciple them. You establish them in the faith. Because evangelism has not actually happened until you have brought somebody to be in fellowship with Jesus and within the context of the church. Amen. George Peter says this. I, I, I quote him again. He says, someone is not truly evangelized until they are settled in the faith, committed to a local church, and functioning in their God-given gifts. So when, when we say we are when we say we are evangelizing, we are doing evangelism with a mindset to say, until this person is added to the church, until this person is established in faith, until this person is walking with Christ, evangelism has not happened. That's why you read in the book of Acts, which you have been reading, it says, and God continued to add daily to the church. They did not just get born again, they were added to the church. They were established in the faith, they were taught how to pray, they were equipped to obey Christ and to begin to grow in their faith. That is evangelism. Hallelujah. Motivation number four. You see, other people's need for Christ grips us so intensely. As we realize that without Christ, they are lost and they are under the threat of an eternal judgment. You know, sometimes we forget. When you talk about good news, we forget that without Christ, we have no hope. Without Christ, people are dying. They are heading, galloping, if I may use that word, galloping to hell. They are on a fast speed train to hell. And the, when we talk about a harvest, we are saying create an edge, you go with an edge and say, to interrupt their headlong, they fall into hell. So when I understand that somebody is dying and going to hell, and I, say, and, and I begin to say, no, 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 they don't have to die. God has already done something, and I want to interrupt that much towards hell. So we have forgotten what we have been redeemed from. <coughs> we have forgotten the prospect of an eternal fire and the damnation that is there for those who don't know Christ. 
You see, does the grief of a hell, being without God and without hope, doesn't it give us an agency for evangelism? See, 2 Corinthians 5, 10 to 11 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Then verse 11 says, Knowing therefore the terror of God, we persuade men. So when I understand there is a judgment to come, there is a hell to face, there is a hell to shun, and a heaven to gain. When I understand that, that people without God, I am not interrupting them. It's not a personal issue. They are dying and going to hell. And I need to interrupt them and bring them to the faith. So their need is a motivation. I'm doing them a favor when I tell them about Jesus. They may out to outwardly look like they, they, it's not a favor, but in reality they know it. I mean, it's, 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 like, it's like somebody is drowning you are outside a, a, a river and somebody is drowning and you can do something, you know how to swim. You can go in and, and, and save them and, and, get, and, and help them out. You, you're not going to say, I, I don't know, uh, probably I am, I am uh, invading their privacy or I may, uh, you, you know, I, I'm not so sure. I would rather let them, uh, let them drown in dignity. You don't do that. You, you jump in. You don't even say, excuse me, can I save you? Can I help you? You go in and you do what is necessary. Hallelujah. I mean, before COVID, if you saw somebody who was, uh, who was beginning to having breathing problems and they're about to die and, they, and things are happening and they're gasping, you didn't even say, you know what, you do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. You didn't even say, excuse me, can I put my lips on your lips? No, we will discuss those things later. You just go in and you resuscitate the person. And people are dying in sin. And yet we are saying, I, I don't know, can, can I, do, do I have their permission? They're drowning in sin. They're dying. He says, knowing therefore the terror of God, we persuade men. And that, my brethren, should motivate us to tell the story of Jesus. You see, we have to understand that apart from Christ, all people are sinners and they are sentence of death. Do you remember how Romans 5, 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and through death, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all, because all have sinned. People are living in sin, wallowing in sin. They are actually walking dead. But we can bring them to life in Christ. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. People need help. So we need to be motivated to tell the story and bring them to the knowledge of Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Motivation number five. The very message of the gospel itself inspires the work of the harvest. The very message of the gospel. What is really the message of the gospel? The message of the gospel is this. John 14, 6. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father apart from me. And many people are deluding themselves, saying there are many ways to heaven, there are many ways to God. Listen to me, please stop press. There is only one way. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. If you are following any other way which is outside Jesus, you are not going to the Father. You are not going to heaven. So when people need to know the message itself is exclusive. You know, people are saying, oh, let's be inclusive. Let's allow everybody else. Let's allow everybody's truth. No, it's not everybody's truth. There's only one truth, and that truth is Jesus. Until you have an encounter with Jesus, your sins are forgiven you. You cannot make it to heaven. You cannot make it to God. I am sorry it may insult you. You may not be happy that I'm looking down on your religion, but it's not about your religion. It's about a relationship with God. The God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He says there's only one way to reach me and it is through my son Jesus because he's the one who gave his life for the forgiveness of our sins. So we have to tell people it is exclusive. You, can, you don't choose your way to him. Amen. Acts 
nor is there any salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given to men through which we can be saved. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I know we live in a postmodern world. I know people will tell you all kinds of things. They will tell you there's no wrong way, there's no right way. They lie to you. Why do they fail you in class? Why do you fail? Because if there's no wrong way, no right way, then if, if I say one plus two equals seven, it, 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 to me that should be my truth. You should pass me. So why do you fail me? So there's only one name given to men for salvation. That's why we have to proclaim the good news. That's why we are motivated to tell. Because until people know that name, until people have a relationship with that person and call on that name, they cannot be saved. It's not they may know, they might not. It's they cannot. It's impossible to be saved outside the name of Jesus. So the very message of the gospel is exclusive. And he says, we have to tell the story. We have to proclaim that name. See, that, that, is, that is why Paul says, for we, uh, we, uh, we do not preach ourselves, but we preach Christ and him crucified. Why? Because he knew that it's not in the name of Paul. It's not in the name of the pastor. I know most of people say, oh, you know what? I am a prophet. I am prophet so and so. No, 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 no. You, you, don't, you are not the door to heaven. You are the, there is only one name given to men. It's not the name of your pastor. I know you love your pastor. I know you love your apostle. I know you love your prophet. Unfortunately, Acts 4, 12 says that is only one name given to man and then through which we find salvation and it's the name Jesus. Amen. That's the name we preach. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See Romans 1 16 says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ Jesus. I am motivated because the message of the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's the power to save. It's the power to heal. It's the power to redeem. It's the power to transform. It's the power to redeem breaking marriages. It's the power to give hope. It's the power to redeem broken careers. There is power in the gospel. You see, we are not just talking about heaven. We are saying when you know Jesus, there is a change that comes into your life in the here and now. God is not just somebody waiting in the pie in the sky. God is interested in your year and now. Amen. I know people who were, who were almost dead as drug addicts. But when they had a relationship with Jesus, life was restored to them. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Motivation number six. See, the work of the harvest is motivated by God's desire for all men to be saved. When I know that it is God's desire that all may be saved, then it compels me to tell the message to all. So we, we are driven by, the, by what God values. You see, God does not want anybody to perish. You say, our eternal God gave his only son to rescue, to redeem, to restore all of creation so that all could spend eternity with him. So if I follow God, I value his greatest desire. So as believers, it is our responsibility to push forward his greatest desire. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, this is what the Bible says. This is good and pleasing before God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So I know it is God's desire that no one would perish, but that people may come to the knowledge of Christ. And in John 3, 7, it says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God desires people to be saved. He desires people to come to Christ. In 2 Peter 3, verse 9, this is what it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some people count slackness, but he is long-suffering. He is patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that they should come to repentance. If God is not willing that any should perish, it behoves us, it compels us believers, it compels us church, that we must go and tell the story. We have to tell the story of Jesus. 
Jesus. We have to go and tell the good news. You know, many people have been lied to, too. They have been told, oh, God is angry with you. I mean, God wants to kill you. God is angry because you are, you are a homosexual. God is angry because you are a drug addict. No, God is not angry at homosexuals. God is not angry at lesbians, but he doesn't endorse them. He wants to deliver them from that lifestyle. He wants to change them from the, from the oppression. I mean, how, how do you come and say, you know what, I don't know whether I'm a man and a woman. He wants to redeem you from that confusion and the lies of the enemy and bring you to the freedom of who you really are. Hallelujah. God does not desire that any should perish. And therefore, we must go tell. And that should be our motivation. Come on now. He wants all to come to repentance. Motivation number seven. We're getting close. You see, we are motivated by the imminent return of Christ. That there is an agency in the air because Jesus is coming soon. The, 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 it's, it's like there's a time, there's, there's, a, there's a limited time to reach the unreached because Jesus is coming. Do you remember in Matthew 24, 7, 14, he says that this gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all the earth and then the end will come. So it must be preached. There is a need for the preaching of the gospel so that people may hear because God does not want people to die and go to hell. So there is an agency. We, we, we call it an eschatological agency. There is a pressure that says we must tell the good news. People must hear the story before the close of the age. You know, they, they, they tell a story. I mean, we, we have just recently heard about the, the disaster of people who wanted to go in and inspect the Titanic and they wanted to, to see what was happening there and they, they went down and they were warned by people say, you know what, your, 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 whatever, your capsule, your vehicle, whatever it is, it's not safe down there. But they put in a lot of money and they went down and they died, which is unfortunate. But you see, here is the story. You see, when the Titanic sunk, a story that is not often told is that there was a preacher called John Harper and his family. They were on that maiden ship. And that preacher, they just like they said, let's, let's release the women and the children to go and uh, while, the, the, while the boat was, while it was sinking. And they say he was preaching the gospel. He died while he was preaching gospel. Even when he was sinking, he was saying, he was saying just if one more soul, the, the gates are closing, and he was preaching, there was an agency. He was not even thinking about his life because he knew that his, his future was secure, but he was concerned about the souls of people, and that's the motivation we must have. When we talk about an eschatological agency, we are saying don't concern, concern yourself about ourselves. We are so self-preserving. We are thinking, is this, is this conducive enough for me? What if I'm beaten up if I tell them, about Jesus? What if I'm mocked if I'm told about Jesus? We are too self-preserving but when we understand the imminency of the return of Christ, when we understand that the window is going to close, when we understand that a day is coming soon, just like Noah and he was calling and saying, guys, come into the ark. One of these days the door will be closed and there will be no hope, there will be no redemption. That's what the, that's the age in which we live. We need to let the world know that soon and very soon the window of opportunity for salvation will be closed. So there's an age there's an imminence of the return of Christ. And that should compel us to bring in the harvest. Soon and very soon, we will see the king. But that compels us with an eschatological agency to tell the story. And that's motivation number seven. Listen, listen, saints, we need to tell the story. We need to bring in the harvest before the crop is spoiled. Finally, number eight, we are motivated to bring in the harvest because Jesus is king. We are inspired by the kingship of Jesus. You see, if Jesus is king, then his word is my command. What his personal mission 
is my command. You see, we don't value eternity out of fear, or out of, but, but out of the same love that motivated God to love us so selfishly, selflessly, and sacrificially. Now we are motivated to bring in the harvest because our king gave a vision. And this is the vision he, he left us. In Acts 1 verse 8, he says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In case you don't understand. You see, remember in Luke 19.10, he gave his personal mission statement. says, for the son of man has come to seek and save that which is lost. That is his personal mission. That is core to who he is. That, is. that is the critical thing. You see, so evangelism is at the very core of Jesus' personal mission to seek and save the lost. But he says the way it's going to happen, here is my vision. I'm going to pour out the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, you shall be my witnesses, starting in Jerusalem, into Judea, into Samaria, to the ends of the world. In other words, he saw a, a, a move of God that was an ever-spreading move of witnesses that would cover the whole world. His vision is to say his kingdom will come. His will will be done on earth. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And the vehicle and the agents that he uses to be able to achieve that is a marching army of witnesses that will be telling people about Jesus. And that is our motivation. The king has given us a vision. He has given us a vision to say, this is what I want to see. Where well, I'm, I'm, I'm birthing this church, but I'm leaving you to begin to have an ever-expanding influence as you disciple people, as you disciple the nations for my kingdom. So if we have allegiance to the king, we are committed to his vision. And that's the final motivation to bring in the harvest. So telling the story of Jesus is important for the harvest. Amen. Let me conclude. You see, we are God's agents to touch people and to extend the message of redemption to a dying world. He says the fields are white to harvest, but the laborers are few. They are not motivated. They don't understand the seriousness of the situation. They don't have the agency that is required. But we have to be motivated by his love and his passion for people. And, and I'm convinced that the loss of the hope of heaven and the grief over hell is what is diminishing our pursuit of Jesus' personal mission to seek and save the lost. If we really believed in the reality of heaven and the reality of hell, we would seek to save the lost. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I mean, I grew up in the villages. If a, if a hut caught, caught fire accidentally, even, that, even if it was a witch's house which caught fire, People did not just stand and say, ah, it's, it's a witch, let her die. <laughs> they went in even to, for their enemy to get them out. Because it was a crisis situation. Because they knew the torment of a fiery death. Is it possible that we have lost the sense of the fires of hell? So we can look at people, ah, I mean, I, I've heard even Christians say things that pastors, that will shock you when a pastor says it from the pulpit. They say, go to hell. Yeah, I said it. That's what you're telling people, go to hell. When we refuse to tell them that the fires of hell are real, that they can be saved, they can come to faith, it means that we have lost sight of the reality of hell. And the reality of heaven. Listen my brothers and sisters. There's a heaven to gain. And there's a hell to shun. 
And we have a responsibility before God to go tell the world. I want to pray two prayers. Number one, I want to pray with someone who may be here. Whether you are here on site here or you are joining us online, I want you to know God does not desire that you should perish and die and go to hell. I want to put it very plainly. If you have no relationship with Jesus, without Jesus, if you have not called on his name, you are dying and going to hell. But if you die and go to hell, it's not God's fault. He has already paid the price. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He doesn't want you to perish. The Bible says God did not send his son to condemn the world, but that through him, the world may be saved. God is not condemning you. He knows your lifestyle. He knows where you have been. He knows what he is doing. He, you have done. He is not condemning you. He's saying, I still love you. The Bible in Romans says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All you need to do is to come back to him and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you loved me so much. I thought you condemned me. But in this moment, you can believe on his name. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will give you hope. There is good news. God is not angry with you. He loves you. His arms are outstretched, just like the father of the prodigal son. He, every morning he would look out. He's looking into the far country, expecting to see his son come back. And God peeps out of heaven every day, waiting. Could this be the day that my son is coming home? Is this the day that my prodigal daughter is coming home? May this be the day for you. So I'll ask every head bowed, every eye closed in this auditorium. If you're saying, I don't have that relationship, I want to come back home. I want to come back into a relationship with God. I don't want to die and go to hell. I know I'm choking from the oppression of the devil. I know what the devil has been doing in my life, how he has been harassing me. Some of you, it may have been some terrible experiences at night when you are asleep in your sleep. The devil is tormenting you. But Jesus came to free those who are oppressed of the devil. Or you may not even have harmed a fly, but still you have no relationship with God. You are a moral person, you are, you are a good person, but your goodness is not sufficient. There's only one name which was given to men through which we find salvation, and that's the name of Jesus. So if there's anybody under the sound of my voice, both here in the auditorium, and online. If you want to pray that prayer with me and come into a relationship with God, know that your sins are forgiven you. I want you to just raise your hand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just raise your hand if you are in here. I want to pray with you so that you know beyond a shadow of doubt that Jesus has forgiven your sins and they've given you in your opportunity. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I see that here and God bless you. Can somebody move there? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Jesus wants to forgive you. God is not angry with you. He wants you to come home. Whether you are in media land, you are watching us on YouTube or on Facebook, or whatever platform you are watching, I want you to join us as we pray with this, with this one who is giving, who is giving their lives right here in this meeting. It's also time for you. So I'll ask everybody else to pray with me. And say, Father God, I come to you today and I ask you, forgive my sins. I turn away from my sins and I come to Jesus. I am unworthy but I understand that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He does not want me to perish. 
Lord, I also don't want to perish. Save me from sin. Save me from the devil. Make me your child. I believe today that Jesus came down to earth as a man. He lived without sin. And they crucified him for my sin. And when he shed his blood, it was for the forgiveness of my sins. And I believe that on the third day he rose again as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He conquered death, sin, disease, and sickness. And today, he sits on the right hand of God the Father as Lord, Savior, and Redeemer. So I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Redeemer. Break the work of the enemy over my life. Allow me to walk into freedom. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. For praying that prayer, God has heard you. He has forgiven your sin. He has made you a child of God. In just a moment, I'll ask you to go out with the leader who was praying with you and they'll, they'll talk to you for a few moments. But before you do, I want to pray one more prayer with everybody who is in here. I want, us to, I want you to reflect on yourself. And then just say, Lord, may you stay in me again a motivation for the harvest. I want to obey you. I want to do what you call me to do. I know that you do not desire that any should perish. So today I say yes to your will. I will go and tell them. So I want you, everybody, just where you are, just raise your hands and I want you to talk to God. And affirm your own commitment to say, Lord, I, I want to do everything in my power to help bring in that harvest. Father, we come before your presence, motivated by your spirit, motivated by your word. We commit ourselves to the task of unleashing the redeeming power of the gospel to transform lives and reform communities. Father, we commit ourselves to, to the work of bringing in souls to the knowledge of Christ. Father, we, we, the love of God is fresh in our hearts. For the command of the Lord is, is, is a, is a com, compels us. Father, we, we are compelled by the Lordship of Jesus and we commit ourselves that we will go and tell the story. Father, I pray that you motivate us. I pray that you, you inspire us. I pray... <clears throat> for a sense of agency in our, in our church, in our lives, in our families to tell the story. Father, I break every spirit of procrastin procrastination. I break every reluctance. I break every lethargy. I break every spirit of apathy. And I speak in agency. Father, stay in us, stay in us in agency to go tell the story. For your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Amen. Ma'am, you can, you can go out this way and just have a chat. Hallelujah. Let's just appreciate her for giving her life to Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Church, we need to take seriously the work of evangelism. Amen. I just want to emphasize the, that uh, we are having the equipping track, the first session today. Uh, so we will have, once we break out, those who are doing the equipping track, in 15 minutes after the service, please be seated and we will we'll kick off. Thank you so much. Let's welcome Pastor Nyasha. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen.
That was a very, very profound word, Doc. We appreciate you for that. It made me to think, um, just going back two, two or three weeks ago, um, a certain family member from my side of the family uh, came to our fathers and um, confessed um, shocking things um, um, about their lives and about their involvement in in witchcraft and certain things. And um, this exposed a lot of um, unsettling truths um, and it affected a lot of people. And um, immediately after exposing uh, or rather sharing with the whole family what had been happening over, spanning over 50 years, right? Um, they, they were sick. They started, you know, um, losing their mind. They were taken to a psychiatric ward and they started, you know, delabilating de de faster, deteriorating. Their health was deteriorating. And just last week, as I was also trying to process, because it was a lot, um, the Lord spoke to me during my devotions and said, instead of trying to figure out why and why, why they did what they did, why don't you pray for his soul? Why don't you pray for him? You know, you're not in Zimbabwe. You can't go and visit him. He's not speaking anymore. He's not in his right senses. So you can't really call him and say, I want to lead you to the Lord. Why don't you pray for his soul? And it was the most difficult thing I've ever done. I had questions. I, I really wanted to understand why. But from today's message and from what Doc has mentioned that God's desire is to get everyone into the kingdom of God. No matter what they have done, no matter where they are, no matter the involvement in the demonic or whatever it is, God's desire is to have everyone. And I'm so thankful that I heeded to the word of God and I prayed. I prayed for my uncle. I prayed for him. And he left us on Friday and he was led to rest yesterday. So I just want to say to somebody, this word is very, very important for you to just take a pause and say, Lord, help me to lead everyone that I can to the Lord. You know, when you go to heaven, it will be so nice and so great for the Lord to show you so many people that you've led to the kingdom of God. I want to be one of those people who's going to be shown a room full of people that I've led to Christ, my children included. Amen. So please, let's, let's take this word seriously. Amen. Amen. So the value for the week today is the, an attitude of gratitude. And it's so amazing how difficult it is for us to be thankful. We do not have issues or challenges with memorying and complaining about what's happening in our lives. We, we seem to be very, very quick to complain, quick to raise issues or quick to share our challenges, but when it comes to sharing the word of God um, and sharing our thankfulness and our, our gratitude to what the Lord has done, it, it has become a serious pro problem for Christians to do. I could not help but discover one day when I joined one of the midnight prayers and the leader, Pastor Batsi, was like, um, before we start praying, and this is what he usually does, let's just thank the Lord, you know. Let's take time to thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for what he has done. Thank the Lord for the season that you're in. Thank the Lord for what he's doing in your life and what he's going to do. And for the first five minutes, we had a lot of people, you know, he switches on the mic and unmutes everybody else and people start thanking the Lord. And it's only the first five or three minutes that people really actually go into thanking the Lord. And then after that, people go on to raise their issues. And you start hearing someone praying for Oscar to be married and what have you. And we are, we are supposed to be praying and giving thanks to the Lord. And this is not only limited to that one night or all night prayer. Even in our own prayers, how much time do you take to thank the Lord? 
for what God is doing in your life, for what the Lord has done in your life. You know, an attitude of gratitude means making conscious Making the, making the conscious habit of expressing and appreciate, appreciating on a regular basis for the big and the small things. Have you ever thanked God for the small little things? Thanking the Lord for, 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 for giving you life. You know, my mom used to, was a homemaker throughout my life. Um, and then after ironing, she used to say, And I never used to understand why do you thank the Lord for you know, you've just finished ironing. And after cooking and washing the dishes, she would say, thank you, Lord, each and every time. Then one day I asked her, and I said, why do you always thank the Lord? I mean, it just didn't make sense. It's just ironing. And she says, how many people have you had, you know, that they, they collapsed whilst washing dishes or they collapsed whilst ironing or something happened to them or there was an electric shock when they were ironing and, you know, that was the end of their lives. I need to thank the Lord that I've managed to actually finish this ironing. I need to thank the Lord that I've actually managed to finish this cooking. And that was so profound to me. And the Lord began to show me instances and areas in my life that I needed to thank the Lord. Can we go to the next, the previous one? Oh yeah, this one. Okay. So we've got so many scriptures in the Word of God that show us the attitude of gratitude. If we go to First Thessalonians 5.18, it says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter the season. The commandment is to give thanks to the Lord in all seasons. Amen. Psalms 104, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving. And his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Philippians 4, 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything. Do not worry about anything. But in everything, in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, thanksgiving present your requests to God. Colossians 3, 15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in all in, in the name, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 3:17. Now, after reading these scriptures and listening to more sermons on what it really means to be thankful and to have an attitude of gratitude, I started evaluating my own journey. Uh, of gratitude, with gratitude, and I realized that I'm well attuned to the fact that I need to start my prayer with the prayer of thanks, thanksgiving, but am I really thankful? Am I in a position where I can really go and say, you know what, this, the, this 10 days, I'm actually just going to, to go and fast just to thank the Lord. How many of us have done that? Just 10 days of thanking the Lord fasting and being thankful, or you go for your 21-day fast, or you go for your 30-day fast, and all you're doing is just saying, you know what, I'm not going to ask for anything. I'm just going to try and find things that I can be thankful for the Lord. How many of us have ever done that? Myself included, I've never done that. And the Lord started showing me that so many opportunities in your spiritual journey with the Lord can be opened up if you get to a place of having an attitude of gratitude. This is a picture of my father in 1964 and his siblings. My dad is the small little guy. He's the last born in a family of seven. I'm not so sure where the other three were. Um, but this was in 1964, just four years after my grandfather had passed away. My family is a family that comes from Mozambique. So this is a widow with seven kids. Um, she doesn't know anyone. The husband has died, no family. And she's raising seven kids on her own. 1964, my dad was four years old. And then two years later, when he was playing soccer in the streets of Highfields, I think, um, there was a crusade that was happening just close to where their home was. Um, and it was Apostle E.H. Guti who had started his church under a tree. And my dad was playing soccer in the road. 
and that's when he joined and they had a crusade for the ne next month or so and my dad used to go and visit and just sit and listen and he was only six years old and that was the journey that led him to the Lord and he was the only Christian and the only believer for a very long time in his family and that that, that separated him and separated our own immediate family um, from, a, from a lot of things um, spiritually. And I could not help just realize that I need to be thankful for the legacy of faith. If it had not been the Lord that had led my father, that little boy, two years later after this photo was taken, to go and play soccer near a tree where a crusade was being done and had, had him captivated I would not be here. I would not be here. So I, 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 I want to thank the Lord. I personally thank the Lord, and I'm still thanking the Lord for the gift of legacy. The next photo is a photo of my husband and his mother, my mother in love, Eva's Shikengeja. Um, this woman is a great woman indeed, to be quite honest. She went through a tough time in her marriage, I think for the first 20 years of her marriage. And I remember 10 years ago when we were sitting at home and I asked her, but then why did you stay? I mean, the things that she was sharing with me were so glaring and I just couldn't imagine having to stay and experience a lot of things that she experienced. And she said to me that she decided to make a prayer and decided that she was going to pray for her children's, ma children's marriages. She was going to pray for, for our marriages, for her children, that whenever they got married, this would not happen in, our, in their lives. And I started thinking this week to say, I have a solid marriage. I am enjoying my marriage. Yes, it needs maintenance like all marriages does, but I, I'm standing on an answered prayer because somebody prayed for my marriage 20 years, 18 years ago, and said, this will not be repeated in my children's life. And that is the legacy of faith. And she decided to seed and serve pastors and serve men of God in, in, in the name of wanting this generational demonic thing that was happening in, in her own marriage to stop so that it won't happen in our marriages. So I'm just, wanted, I'm just giving examples. I've got so many examples, guys. But then take Take, take time to evaluate. Put your challenges aside and say, what are the things that I can be thankful for? What are the things that I can actually use to cultivate an attitude of gratitude in my life? Amen. So today, I just want us to take time as we offer, give our offerings, our tithes, to say, Lord, Reveal to me areas in my life where I need to be thankful. I want to build altars of thankfulness in my family. Altars where I gather up my children and my family and say, you know what? The Lord has done so much for us. Or the Lord is doing a great thing in our family during this hard season. To just have time to thank the Lord and have an attitude of gratitude. In Hebrew, gratitude means, it's, it's pronounced hakarat hatov, which means recognizing the good. Practicing gratitude means recognizing the good that is already yours. Having to realize the promises that God has spoken over your life and actually being thankful for them. Hallelujah. So I'm just going to ask the ashes to just move around and if you need an envelope for your tithe, if you need your envelope for building fund, please make sure that you um, label correctly so that we can know exactly where to forward your offering. And I just want to pray as we do that. Father, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the gift that you've given us to being able to give thanks to you, Lord. We know that giving thanks to you, Father, opens opportunities for your spirit to work in our lives. Even in the hard seasons, Father, give us the capacity to praise and to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. I just feel like singing this old and goldie. I hope 
um, Pinion knows it. Love is not love until you give it away. Until you give it away, then you know that's love. Love is not love until you give it away. Until you give it away, then you know. Hallelujah. Just a few announcements. We have the Equipping Track series, as Doc mentioned. It is kicking off today, and we will cover the first um, of the five-part series, Discovering the Word. And those attending the session, let's meet in this auditorium after the service at 11.30 a.m. Amen. This is a very, very, very beautiful series of teachings that I would encourage us to take part of. And then July prayer watch, we have a July prayer watch, our all night prayer, um, on Friday the 7th of July, starting from 6.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. The theme is, there is a sound. Hallelujah. The scripture um, is John 6, 5, it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with a ram's horn, and when you're you hear the sound of the trumpet that all the people shall shout with a great shout then the wall of the city will fall down flat and the people shall go up every man straight before him hallelujah so as we meet and pray we are believing that the walls will come down the blind eyes will be open and dead situations will come back to life hallelujah and his glory will come down at the sound of the lord i encourage you to come you know when you come and meet and fellowship with others in prayer. So many things happen. Miracles, signs, and wonders will be part of that session. Hallelujah. And then we do have a father and daughter dinner um, that is being hosted. Uh, this will be happening on Saturday, the 15th of July, 2023, here at CCJ. And the course will just only be 200 rands um, for adults and 175 rands for children below 12 years old. You do not want to miss this fun-filled bonding time. This is so beautiful. I remember my own father and daughter dinners. It was so, so beautiful. So please make sure that you encourage your friends, your colleagues um, who have daughters that they need to come. That is also... Child. Child. Um, here it says daughter. Oh, it's changed to child. Is it... Brother Russell, you're getting me into trouble. But anyway, so you can bring your son, you can bring your daughter um, to the dinner. Amen. Amen. Um, we still have our VIPs. Amen. We want to love on you. We want to tell you all about Celebration Church. We're such a very huge family. We're not only in Johannesburg, but however, I'll leave that to a team that will take you through the ministries that we have, different areas that you can join and be part of the church. Amen. So if you can follow Deaconess, and we can love you and enjoy. Yes, you can just follow him. He's just raising his hand. Welcome to celebration. Let's celebrate together. Welcome to celebration. Let's celebrate together. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's celebrate together. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's celebrate together. Welcome.
Hallelujah. And I forgot to welcome those who are joining us from other CC FOCs. So if you're here and you're joining us from any of our FOC churches, please let us know so that we can also love on you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, okay, just correction there. So equipping track series will only start at quarter past 11, not half 11. All right. Do we have those born in the month of June? If you may stand up so that we can celebrate you, June babies. bless you and take this month on you happy birthday happy birthday may he shine on you and grant you favor too we celebrate you because God made you we celebrate you today I see your dad is eyeing your chocolate. It's only for you. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. If we may rise for a benediction. <laughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May you have a blessed, blessed week ahead. Amen. Amen. Amen.